How many stocks do you think it takes to build a diversified dividend income portfolio? 20 stocks? 30 stocks? More? Think again. In this episode, we'll hear why one investor believes just five stocks can be all that it takes and how you can build one of your own. You're watching Inside Investing. Hello everyone and welcome to Inside Investing, the show that helps you level up your financial knowledge and sharpen your investing skills. I'm your host Rob Moise and joining us today is Henry Ma, founder of Your Ever Growing Income. Henry is an accomplished author who's written several books on income investing and he blogs regularly about his investing experience. Henry, it's great to have you on the program. You're one of my faves. Welcome back. It's always great that you can take the time to join us. Hi Robert and thanks again for having me on your show. I appreciate it. Yeah, I always uh, love talking to you, Henry, because you do two things really well. You, one, are really passionate about dividend investing and, and conveying like why you love it so much and the rationale for it. Uh, but number two, you always find a way to challenge our conventional, traditional thinking uh, about what it means to be an investor and specifically a dividend investor. So, um, so you know, before we kind of get into the meat of our conversation here, five stock portfolio, that certainly challenges some conventional wisdom. Um, why don't you just get to our viewers who might not be familiar with you caught up on you know your approach to dividend investing when you concentrate on earning an income from your portfolio and from the individual stocks that you own you almost eliminate all of the risks that's associated with the stock market there's really only one risk that you enter into and you can minimize that and that's the uh the the possibility of a dividend cut you know, people say dividends aren't guaranteed, that the company uh, board of directors can eliminate the dividends anytime they feel like it, or they might decide to cut the dividend. That's always a possibility. But quality companies, companies that, uh, you know, have paid and increased their dividends for years and years, uh, they recognize that their show, shareholders uh, expect the company to maintain a certain uh, dividend policy. And they want to make sure that the dividend isn't excessive. They want to make sure that the company can still grow. Uh, they can expand, uh, but they want to pay out a healthy portion of those uh, earnings to their shareholders. And that's what income investing is all about, is concentrating on those companies that will pay you a consistent, reliable, and almost a safe dividend year after year. And one of those things that uh, you also can challenge on the conventional wisdom side of things is, you know, you don't place much emphasis on diversification. You don't place uh, emphasis on rebalancing a portfolio or anything like that. You're, you're not even really that concerned about the share price. Why are you comfortable just focusing on the income growth itself and, and nothing else? So you don't need to concentrate on the price of the share. You, you certainly look at the price when you're buying, but once you've bought, you can ignore price. All you care about is will the company continue to pay you the income you expect, especially in the Canadian market. There is not a broad spectrum of companies like there is in the United States. Uh, you know, we're, we've got, <laughs> we have maybe four or five, six sectors at most with three, four, five, six companies in each sector that might qualify as quality companies. Amongst those, you can select just a few of them, maybe the top two or three. And if you stick with just those, spread your investments across three or four sectors uh, amongst the best stocks that you believe will continue to pay you and raise the dividend, then you don't need to worry about vast diversification. You don't need to invest outside of Canada. Certainly, if you want to, that's, that's open to you. Uh, but you don't need to go to other markets. And you've got these four rules that you've told us about in the past that help you identify those dividend stocks that consistently pay and consistently grow, or at least have done so, uh, their dividend in the past. Can you refresh our memory on what those four rules are? When you do your analysis, we do it up front. And we try to identify, like I mentioned, the best stocks in various sectors. And I do that by applying what I call four rules. And the first one, of course, is that if a company cuts the dividend within the past 10 years, you ignore it. You don't even consider it. It could be they might have cut the dividend 10 years ago. But if it's within that 10-year period, 
uh, I suggest that you ignore that stock. Move on to others. The second rule is the company must have paid a dividend for a minimum of 10 years. And I prefer companies that have paid a dividend for 25, 50, 100 years. The longer, the better, all right? And it, I'm talking about consistently paying the dividend year after year after year. The third rule is that I like to see or identify companies that have raised the dividend at least eight out of the past 10 years. Uh, it's, it's great if they do it every year, but I want to eliminate a stock just because they missed a dividend increase in one year for a specific reason. Right? Um, and then finally, you want a growth aspect. You want to identify companies that have raised their dividend by a minimum of 75% over the past 10 years. And you need that because when you're looking at into the future, if you identify four or five stocks that uh, they'll only raise the dividend, say 45 or 50% over the past 10 years, well, when you're looking at companies for next year, you say, well, why would I consider investing in that company when they've, they have a, such a low growth rate? I'd rather stick with companies that have a 75% or 90% or 100%. Uh, and there are companies out there that uh, do have long track records of raising their dividend at a reasonable rate. And, uh, you know, you want a, a long history of that. You know, you're, you're not looking for companies that raise the dividend by 30, 40% a year for the past two or three years. You want to identify companies that have done it for a much longer period. And that will give you the confidence that these are in fact quality companies that will pay and grow their dividend consistently going forward. And the idea is just to kind of continually build up through consistency that dividend snowball, if you will, and see the income that you're generating from your portfolio continue to rise year after year after year. Uh, yeah. Really interesting stuff. Uh, and those rules certainly play into what we're going to talk about today with the five stock portfolio. Uh, all right, let's get to the topic at hand here, the five stock dividend portfolio. Um, without further ado, of course, um, just tell us, though, like, what gave you the idea to come up with something like this? I got a fair number of emails. Uh always asking me, you know, can you identify these companies or can you give us more explanation? And so I finally decided, well, I think I can provide um, some recommendations that will help them without actually telling them which stocks to buy. And the five stock portfolio isn't me telling you to invest in various stocks. It's me suggesting that uh, you evaluate the stocks using my four rules, and that once you've uh, completed the four rules, you come up with a list of stocks that you like, the ones that you believe are the best stocks in each sector. And then those are the ones you will choose from. Uh, the first, of course, is the banks, Canadian banks. Uh, the second, of course, is the uh, utilities. The third is communications, telecommunications. The fourth is the pipelines. And then finally, I categorize one as called low yield, high growth uh, sector. The idea is to do your analysis following the four rules, break the stocks that you like into the five sectors, and then decide which ones you believe are the best. One stock in each sector, not two or three, but just one of the one they believe is the best stock in that sector. When you have funds to invest, you invest equally in each of the five stocks. The idea is not to decide which one I'm going to put my money into. Uh, invest when you can, as often as you can, and then you're doing basically dollar cost advertising. You know, you're not trying to pick and choose when to invest or which stocks to invest in. You just invest when you have funds. So the dollar cost averaging uh, will even out your investment over time. And there's a, an element of uh, beautiful simplicity here to this, right? Because a lot of investors that we talk to who, who like dividends, they often have portfolios that might be 20, 25, 30 plus even stocks. Um, so why you know, do you think that five can be enough, especially when you might hear people say things like, well, how could a five stock portfolio be diversified enough? I, I usually need 20, 25, 30, right? 
Yeah, it's, you know, we're back to that question of risk. You know, some people might say that you're recommending only five stocks, which is extremely risky. But, you know, if the person has identified what they believe is the best stock in that sector, well, it's not likely you're picking a risky stock. I'm not picking one that has only raised the dividend for two years and, uh, you know, they've they cut the dividend three or four times in the past. So the idea is that by picking the the quality stocks, it's the chances that that company will run into difficulty, financial difficulty, the chances that they'll cut the dividend uh, is extremely small because, again, we're we're ignoring capital appreciation. We're not concerned if the price of the stocks go down. We're only concerned about the income that the companies will will pay you. But if you invested in the best stocks that you can find, it's very unlikely that any of those companies will be affected by the stock market. At least the income that they pay you won't be affected. So what you will find is that when the stock market goes down, your income stays the same or it increases because if prices go down and you invest more money in those five stocks, you're buying them at a cheaper price, which means you're, earn, you're earning more income. Every time the price goes down and you buy more shares using the dividend reinvestment, you're increasing your income. And by you know, following the strategy, you should see your income grow each and every year, year after year after year, regardless of the market or the economic situations. And I think five stocks in five different sectors provides a diversification uh, that most people look at. In fact, most dividend growth investors probably don't invest in that many more sectors. They might have six or seven, but they certainly have these five. And these five would probably be considered their core holdings. So we're covering off diversification. We're minimizing the risk that the investor is uh, likely get in, to get into. But why those four sectors and why particularly in Canada do you feel they're so compelling? Well, I think those specific sectors are really the core sectors in Canada. They have the largest companies. Um, a lot of them are uh, international companies. They have holdings or at least they invest in other countries. So you really are diversifying into other markets as well by investing in some of these companies. Now, there are other sectors. And at some point, you may want to add another sector to your portfolio. I want to go back to the low yield, high growth aspect of this five stock portfolio. Uh, what you're describing here is basically stocks that start with a low dividend yield today, but they're growing at a very high rate. So the idea is that they're going to, you know, over time catch up to companies that have more robust payments today. That description can potentially fit a lot of companies. So how do you narrow that list down and make it more manageable. It's part of the analysis process that I talk about, the four rules. When you uh, evaluate those stocks or the dividend paying stocks, you'll come across those uh, low yield, high growth companies. And again, you know, if, if they've raised the dividend by 15 or 20% on average each and every year for the past 15 years or 10 years, uh, then it's likely that they might continue to do so. But the problem, of course, is their yield might be half a percent or one percent or one and a half percent. Uh, so you're not going to earn a lot of income initially, but you don't want to overlook those stocks. I think uh, especially if you're in the accumulation phase of your investments, it's because after about 15, 18 years, if they that company or those companies continue to pay and raise the dividend at 15 or 20 percent a year, You'll, be, you'll find that you're earning more income from those stocks than you are from your average stocks. And you'll also have a much higher capital appreciation over that period. Because as, as the dividend increases, so does the price. They almost go hand in hand. Now, of course, they're not, you know, it doesn't happen every year and there may be periods where it doesn't. But uh, you could almost evaluate uh, the dividend growth over a 10 or 15 year period and you'll find that a company that paid a 4% yield 10 years ago is paying a 4% yield today, but they've raised the dividend every year for the past 10 years. Well, if they've raised the dividend, that means you're earning a lot more income. So the price must have gone up as well to keep it at 4%. And 
the same with those low yield stocks. You know, if they're raising their dividend to 15, 20% a year and the yield is still at 1% or a half a percent, well, that means the price must have skyrocketed. So how do you strike the right balance between the yield and the growth? Uh, is this really just a matter of investor preference, whether they want to focus on a lower yielding one that has a higher growth or one that's maybe got a little bit more of a yield right now, but a slightly lower growth rate? How, how do you thread that needle? If you're only picking four stocks in four sectors, well, you're probably going to find that your average yield when you make your first investment is going to be 4% or 4.5%, right around that range. And then from that point on, every investment you make and every dividend reinvestment you make is going to gradually increase that yield. And that's really the key to income growth investing, is that over the long term, your yield, your income is going to grow with less money invested. And that's something that most people don't understand. If you've followed the income growth strategy for, say, 15 or 20 years, you might have started out with earning a 35 or 4% yield on your investments. But over time, that yield is going to grow. And after 10 or 15 years, you're probably earning 55 6 5 maybe even 7% on the money you've invested. Not on the market value. I'm talking about your investment, which would include uh, new purchases and dividend reinvestment. So it's your total investment into those stocks. And that's really what you should expect is that you get a rising yield the longer you remain invested in the dividend growth stocks. Hey, rising yield on investment. That sounds like the name of somebody's <laughs> blog. Uh, anyway, yeah. <laughs> interesting. I guess that's where it came from, right? Yeah. And, you, you know, I, I'm going to add one other thing, Robert. Uh, you know, people suggest that, well, why not just buy a, a high yielding ETF? And uh, there's some good ones out there, you know, that uh, really do pay a reasonably high yield. But if you compare them to individual stocks or a dividend growth portfolio of stocks with an ETF, the growth rate will be slower. So the ETF will have dividend growth or distribution growth, but it won't be as fast or as much as the individual stock dividend portfolio. It's it's not a hard comparison. In fact, I, I actually have this comparison on my blog where I invest in individual stocks and I do a comparison. I do the same thing. I, if I invest in particular stocks, I add an investment into a particular ETF. And after a year and a half, or I'm sorry, almost, uh, yeah, is a year and a half? Maybe two years. Uh, I find that, you know, I'm earning... 30% more income than that high yield dividend ETF. So to me, 30% is a considerable income difference. Um, so in your mind then, what sort of investor would a five stock dividend portfolio make sense for? You want to start a, a investment fund for your child, or if you're new to investing, but even for someone that has a pretty healthy investment uh, account, might want to say, I just want to simplify my investments. You've sort of touched on the value of, of drips or dividend reinvestments as part of the process here. Why are you such a fan of those? Uh, some other investors might argue, well, I like to pick and choose where I reinvest that yep. dividend income, but you like drips. Why is that? Yeah. Well, a lot of people prefer to just let the money sit in the account. And when they add new money to it, they combine it and then they invest it where they want to. And that's fine. You know, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, look, it works. I like to have every dollar that I've invested working for me as quickly as possible so that if I receive $50 in a, you know, dividends, I want that money invested immediately. I want to buy one share, two shares or whatever it is. So that next quarter, when I receive my next dividend, I know for sure that I'm earning more income. I didn't have to do anything. You know, you, you compound your, your income by reinvesting those dividends, by adding new money uh, so that your income is constantly growing, right? If you hold off, sure, you might achieve the same thing. You might achieve more, maybe less, but you don't know. You know, maybe by the time you buy, the stock market has gone up, so the yield has dropped. Or, you know, it could go down, but it's kind of a guessing game. But if you reinvest automatically, you've eliminated uh, that you just don't have to worry about. That's nothing, something you just can ignore.
Right. Now, there's some debate uh, amongst the dividend investing community on this next question here for you. But do you have any thoughts on the optimal, if you will, investing account to own a five stock portfolio like this? I'm a strong believer in that the first account anybody should open or the first account they should max out is their tax free savings account. You know, if they haven't maxed out their tax free savings or they've, you know, they've got previous years uncontributed funds, then they should concentrate on maxing out their TFSA. And then of course, once they do that, they want to uh, contribute the maximum that they are allowed as early as possible. In other words, in January, every dollar in the tax-free savings is generating more and more income that is totally tax-free regardless when you take it out. My second choice would be a non-registered account. And the only reason I would recommend a RRSP is if somebody has a company uh, matching program where the company is willing to match funds with your RRSP contributions up to a certain limit, then I think they should take advantage of that. Get the money in the RSP, get that free money from the company. I find that uh, people make the assumption that when they retire, their income will be lower so that they will pay less tax because they're earning less money. For people that can afford to max out their tax-free savings account, can afford to max out their RRSP and still have money to invest in property or non-registered account, they're not going to end up with a low income by the time they retire. They probably have a company pension. They probably, they're going to collect Canada pension and old age security. Uh, their wife may have worked and uh, have earnings. They're going to be in a high tax bracket. And when they have to start taking money out of their RSP or their RIP account, they're going to be taxed at the highest marginal tax rate. And they're going to find themselves in a situation where they're finally saying, well, I'm just going to leave the money in the RIF account till I die and leave my, let my dependents worry about the income tax. And they'll be taxed at probably 50%. It's interesting to hear you kind of put the RRSP kind of last on the, on the list of the three there, though, um, just given how much we hear uh, about people loving the RRSP and that, and that tax deduction that they can get. You know, certainly, you know, I, I haven't run the numbers, but, you know, and people say that, well, when you get that rebate, reinvest it immediately, put it into your tax-free savings uh, or put it into your non-registered. But I question how many people really do that. You know, if they get a 2000 or $3,000 rebate, uh, you know, I think there's lots of things they'd like to buy. So they're more likely spending that money. So they're losing the the big advantage of that tax rebate if they don't reinvest it right away. Henry, I've had the Caribbean sun beckoning me come TIA, uh, RRSP rebate time, right? So I, I know the temptation. I know the temptation. I'm yeah. sure others have been there too, uh, but you're right. If you can resist it, it's certainly <laughs> certainly a good tax move at least. Um, anyway, uh, so we've talked a lot about five stock portfolio here and the rationale behind that, but you also have a twist on this, the 10 stock portfolio. So walk us through the rationale here. How does the 10 stock differ from the five stock? You may decide, well, I'd like to expand my portfolio uh, or I'd like to be more uh, selective about which stocks to buy and when. So I decided to uh, come up with a 10 stock dividend growth portfolio. And it doesn't change much. All you do is you pick two stocks from each of those same sectors two banks, two communications, two pipelines, two utilities, and two low-yield, high-growth stocks. And instead of investing uh, automatically, uh, what you have to do is learn how to uh, evaluate the stock price based on the yield difference. All dividend companies have a long-term average yield. So if you look at the dividends that they uh paid over the past, say, 15 years or 20 years. Well, the average yield for that company might be 3.5%. When you have money to invest, what you will do is select the stock which pays the higher yield. So if one stock is paying a 4.2% yield and another stock is paying a 4.9% yield, well, you'll, buy, you'll invest in the 49 and so you're really uh, becoming you know, an advanced income growth investor. <laughs> so that gap in current yield, why is that so attractive from, if you want to call it this, a market timing perspective? 
you've got something that tells you the minimum price you should pay for a stock. So uh, as an example, say the company has a 15-year a, a average yield of 4.2%. Well, the idea is you don't want to bias that particular stock if the yield is below 4.2% on today's price. So when you see that, you move on to the next stock. And uh, if you do that consistently, if you always invest when you're buying a little bit higher yield, then you're earning more income automatically with every purchase that you make. The idea here is that you're essentially purchasing a stock at what could be considered an undervalued price, at least based on history. Yes, exactly. Yeah. But you have a, you're not guessing. You know, you've got that long-term average yield to tell you whether that's a good undervalued price or whether it's maybe it's average, right? So I'm I'm sort of suggesting that they continue to spread their money across the five sectors. Uh but just buy at a higher yield. So you're earning a little bit higher income with your investments. You're, you're concentrating on the income that you're generating from your investments. Capital appreciation is just a bonus. And if it happens, great. If it doesn't, it doesn't matter. How do you avoid falling into so-called yield traps where let's say the current yield is much higher than the historical. It looks really enticing and you want to kind of dive in, but there could be trouble on the horizon. How do you avoid that temptation? Well, well that's the, you know, that, that average yield, the long-term average yield lets you know that. Uh, certainly when a stock, and like I say, if it's 1% to 2% above the long-term average, that's a good time to buy. Anything above the 2% to 3% or whatever, that's the time you want to step back and say, what's causing this stock to offer such a high yield? Why is the price drop so much? It might just be an economic situation where that whole sector is undervalued. For whatever reason, people just don't like that the stocks in that sector. They feel that it's not a good time to buy. So you, in that case, you wouldn't worry about it. But if it's a, if one company within the same sector is offering a 3% yield difference, where every other stock in the sector is offering a 2% yield difference, well, that's probably a financial difficulty. What would cause you to sell one of the stocks in a five stock or a 10 stock portfolio? You've obviously set a very high bar here for these stocks to clear. So what would change your thinking? <laughs> There's a fifth rule that I didn't mention before, but uh, that will indicate the fifth rule basically says if a company's yield, dividend growth yield drops below 3%, it might be they only raise the dividend by 2% or 1%. Well, that's an indication that the company is having difficulty meeting those dividend payments. And that might be a time to sell. You might decide this company is having trouble. And of course, their yield will go up as well. Very likely the price will drop, the yield will go up. So those two indicators will tell you that uh, you might want to look very seriously at this company and decide, is it time to get out or is it time to stop adding to that investment? If you believe the company is still a solid company, they'll recover, they have sufficient cash flow to continue to pay and grow the dividend, they just can't afford to raise it the way they have in the past, you might stick with it. If any of the companies in the five-stock portfolio or even the 10-stock portfolio cut the dividend or you believe they're going to cut the dividend, then you should sell and reinvest that money into another stock in the same sector. All right, Henry. Well, we've run the gamut here, uh, certainly touched on a lot here. You've given us a lot to think about, but we're going to have to leave it there for now. Uh, thanks for filling us in on the five stock and the 10 stock portfolio, the rationale behind them. I think you've maybe given us uh, some, something to think about here. Maybe less is more in some cases, right? Uh, anything you want to touch on that we didn't make note of in our conversation here before we go? Well, you know, I, I probably said it, and I really believe that you must do your evaluation up front. It's not just the random selections, the ones you think are the best. You really want to go through uh, an analysis of the companies within each sector. And if you follow the four rules or the five rules that I uh, recommend, it'll simplify that job, and it really will eliminate a lot of the weaker stocks, right? So don't make random selections. Uh, don't pick stocks because you think they're good. Pick them because 
the numbers say they're good and then you believe that the company can continue uh, to pay and grow the dividend going forward. All right, wise words, Henry. We appreciate your insight as always. Uh, thank you again so much for joining us and sharing your insight here. And for those in our audience, thank you for joining as well. And a quick note to you, make sure that you check out our library of on-demand content and our upcoming webinars. Make sure to register for those. We've got lots on tap here for you. Um, thank you again for joining us today and we'll see you all next time. Have more questions? Then check out the links to the right and in the description below.